lovely to see so many people here, and I know there are others who want to get in, but they just, you know, these are two popular poets. These are the new model Fords. Um, um, fabulous metallic new talents. Um, the new generation of poetry in Cork City. Um, and I, I think you're really going to enjoy this reading by John Fitzgerald and John Mead. Um, John Mee might appear to be a very, very new poet, having recently won the Patrick Cavan Award, but I first became aware of John Mee in 2007. He had an absolutely extraordinary poem, which was published in the Cork Literary Review, that time edited by um, Eugene O'Connell and Sheila O'Hagan and John W. Sexton. Um, and I thought there was this brilliant poem squeezed in at the beginning of the uh, journal between Richard Murphy and Gregory O'Donohue, um, a poem called Apocrypha. And what I thought was absolutely amazing, I found somebody who was willing to rhyme the mad nerval with Apocrypha. And I said to myself, this is sharp stuff. Um, here is a super aware craftsman. Um, and in fact, he had been writing poetry, John Mee had been writing poetry much earlier than 2007, but his first poems were published around 1991, 1992, I think. Um, but an incredibly modest person. In fact, both these poets could be considered um, as modest as they are intelligent. Um, uh, men who are quietly accomplished in other areas of life, so that they don't come to poetry expecting attention. They come to poetry looking for something else, which is, I think, another kind of perfection of the work and the life in another area of life, which makes their work doubly interesting. Rather like the work of um, C.H. Sison, the great English poet of the 50s and 60s, who was really a senior administrator and a, a, an expert in, in, in government administration, are the poems of Dennis O'Driscoll, our own Dennis, whose great expertise was in taxation. Um, but whose interior life was in poetry. So these are exceptional kinds of persons. But John Mee essentially is a man of the law, um, but he's also a fine judge of the weight of words, I think, in other areas. Um, there's an enormous refinement of formality of language in his work. Uh, I'm not surprised that, like, like John Fitzgerald, he actually loves Elizabeth Bishop's work as well. That shows, I think, in all of his work. Um, and he himself, in fact, has spoken earlier about the, the, the endless perfecting of expression in language. In fact, it always in the end has to be abandoned, because even in law it cannot be adequately and perfectly explained. And so the law has taught him something about the entrapment that occurs when we read poetry, and how in fact we have to really surmise ourselves and impute the meaning from our own reading of it. So I think John Mee is absolutely an immensely talented person. Um, Apocrypha and other poems, I hope, will all appear in some magnificent publication sooner or later. Um, although I know his poetry Ireland introductions already in 2008. Um, if you think of his wonderful other life, the critique of cohabitation, words of limitation, words of limitation revisited, under influence and bank guarantees, the return of fertile octogenarians, all these great legal essays which he's published over the years in international legal journals. And I said to myself, this guy is assembling an enormous explosive magazine for a career in poetry. And so he is, you, will, you will absolutely love his work. Um, the poet John Fitzgerald, equally and extraordinarily talented, um, Equally brilliant, um, like myself, a man familiar with libraries, but unlike myself, a man who has actually been prepared to take responsibility for it. Um, so he has, in fact, easily and quite adroitly taken upon himself the, the responsibility of very high administration. Um, but that hasn't in any way dampened the humanity of his work. Um, he can write extraordinary poems. I mean, an amazing poem about the technology of, of location software as an app 
on his phone, an absolutely brilliant one that I remember reading, just a wonderful introduction of new language into poetry and showing us how the contemporary experience has all of the possibilities also of art, as well as the classical experience. But he's also capable, as well as bringing, as bringing in that kind of world of information <coughs> into his work, he's also capable of very kind of intimate moments, uh, moments of at the farm in Lusarda, moments of remembering Nicholas, his son, with, with, with his hen box, um, sort of things that are familial and local that we recognise ourselves as form a kind of total Irish experience. But I think it is a combination in John Fitzgerald, again another poet who really respects the work of Elizabeth Bishop, and again the kind of um, both the irony and texture of the lines show us that this is a person who has understand, understood and absorbed modernism. But he is really a poet who is a poet of the information age, yet a poet who knows how to build the cow. And that's a very important combination in terms of both centering and of travel. So, two extraordinary poets, John Mead and John Fitzgerald. John Fitzgerald will read first, and then John Mead will read. I think you will absolutely love this reading. I think Tom will just let you carry on. Because <laughs> <laughs> nothing could be better than that. <laughs> Thank you very much um, to everybody in the Monster Literature Centre for the invitation to read. Uh, it's a real privilege. Um, uh, and a huge privilege also to be beside John uh, in this context. Um, one of the things that the winning the Patrick Kevin Award uh, allowed me to do and meant for me and enabled for me was a bit of travel. Um, literary travel, there's nothing quite like it, um, uh, including a trip to the United States to uh, participate in a workshop um, uh, and also um, to go to the island of Majorca to uh, give a workshop in that renowned village of Deia, uh, so claimed by uh, Robert Graves as his adoptive home. And so I'm going to be reading some uh, work from my Patrick Kavanagh manuscript and also some work since then, um, including those inspired by uh, the travel that the, the actual award made possible. The first poem I'm going to read is called uh, Light Itinerary and it is um, based in New York, from New York, uh, and it's um, based on the highly poetic uh, topic of a faulty pedestrian crossing light. <laughs> light itinerary. Only the backside bulb of the pale grey walking man is flashing, as though his phone's on silent in his back pocket, ringing, or he's left the flashlight app set to strobe. Slightly stooped, his workmanlike right arm makes him seem a backpacker, hiking city crossings, pavements, parks. Elusive, sketchy, faceless, like the haggard, trolley-hauling homeless who are everywhere here, their eyes avoiding yours, avoiding theirs, as if to say, go, don't go, go, don't go, go. Next poem is also a New York poem. It's based on uh, what's known as the Freedom Tower, which is, has the address 1WTC. Uh, one World Trade Center. It's the one that has replaced uh, the Twin Towers. And it is, um, this poem is a 15 line sentence, essentially. Um, uh, and it is also um, based on the fact that I suppose the um, tower is a, is, a, is a fascinating artifact. It's also uh, hugely challenging and in some ways, uh, if, if, those of you who've seen it or if you see it, quite an alienating structure due to its scale. 1WTC. A schoolyard in Tribeca, mid-morning, mid-winter. Brittle sunshine, sharp inland wind. The yard ringing with swarming cries that gather like gulls around a tall black figure in a dark leather jacket, consenting with a kind smile to take each coloured rubber football and punch it with the top of his big clenched piston fist up, high up, into the air, up where the grinning children's faces follow, their eyes rising beyond fist, beyond head, beyond steel, school, roof, to their own each small ball, 
reaching its exhilarating but dependable point of fall, and indifferent to the still continuing, unreal, upward going of the vast, glimmering glass backdrop to it all, this one thing that will one day become for some of them their everything that is impossible and beyond reasonable reach, like the first unexpected sight of the rest of their lives. Um, now we're going to Australia, um, which uh, as yet uh, I haven't had literary trips to Australia, but I've had some very interesting and rewarding work trips to there. This is another, um, well, I won't say another sonnet, the other one was deliberately not a sonnet. This is a sonnet, and it's called uh, Predictably Down Under. Bushfire smoke trails in a loosening grey helix from Springbrook down over the city and out to sea. Evening light fading, a mauve horizon over a graphite sea, fading fast as I bowl along hedges. A Jolly Roger winks from a shady balcony. The high ho soul sign flashes back as I passed. Two minas, scra two minas scrap noisily in the casuarinas. <coughs> the lights of Q1 flicker, twinkle, and fix on blue. The rhythm of the speed ramps rocks and settles. I am so far down now and away from it all that I mustn't lose sight of the sky. Hold my bearings. Be sure to come back up carefully so it isn't all blown in one go. As I mentioned earlier, the island of um, Majorca was the home to Robert Graves. And while I was there um, in April of last year, I had the privilege of meeting Joanne Graves, who sadly has since died. Um, a much overshadowed son of Robert Graves. And um, while I was there, I had uh, also the, the, the privilege to trace some of Graves' um, daily treks, including the one down to a pier where he used to go for a swim every day um, at about three o'clock, taking a break from his rigorous uh, work schedule. And down there, there's a finca or a big farm which um, has a lot of beautiful orange groves, and I'd say it's been unchanged pretty much for centuries. Um, this is a poem based uh, on, on that walk. It's called La Tramontana. The Serra da, de Tramontana is this backbone to the island of Mallorca, these 90 kilometers of mountains, uh, which are totally different to the high-rise, lowland uh, beaches uh, of the rest of the island. La Tramontana, for Joan Graves. The sheep look up as I pass, surprised elect, Tinny bells spared the busy ringing that lends their forage in the allium and edge of gluttony. They'll clear the ground along the terraces to make way for the olive trees for harvest. Sunlight, grainy, sieved through the groves, suspends life here in old ways. I wait for the brown-skinned boy Christ to saunter around a corner, a half loaf in one hand, three white fishes dangling from the other. While I was there, um, there was some bad weather. Um, it's actually quite a rainy uh, part of the island, much, much wetter than the rest of the island. Uh, and we had a wonderful storm uh, that lasted a night, a day, and, and another night. Um, and this is a poem about the storm. It's also a poem about um, the, the fact that Graves' presence is very strong there, in, 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 and he's still very talked about in the village. And, um, but there's also a strong sense of the things maybe he didn't do as well um, as his writing about the, the, the wake of um, injury, if you want to call it that, uh, discontent that followed um, his trail in, in many ways and through, through, through a number of people uh, during his creative life. It's called All That. That was the night Robert Graves took over my playlist and I woke suffocating in the small mosquito net, net to Irla or Lenord in a pitiful state of despair as though he was trapped in the portable speaker, his only means of escape to sing badly in unintelligible Mallorquin. <laughs> Monica's laptop suffered too, some kind of stroke, forgetting itself and wanting to hibernate incognito. Even Noodle, normally joyous at the prospect of a walk, as promised by my appearance, allowed no signs of life at all. Two long tremors rolled along the base of the valley like boulders, keeping the downpour going after breakfast. And all that day, the dark clouds, low mist, his pernickety voice insistent, 
his trail of havoc moiling above the hills, as if lifted and spun there by something read or said innocently the previous evening, still spinning like a circuit of demons all through the night, the whole invisible town and its past, and every last thing he touched and thought and injured, swarming in black, uncontrollable storm. This is the last of the three day of points. It's a short one. It's called Bow. <coughs> Retracing the narrow, rough track from Solier back to Calabat. Views snatched of a veined sea and the flown hoopoos, bright yellow taperings. Shy wild goats spy from the pines like feral children. I vow never to leave home again. And back home, um, I want to read a poem about my younger sister. Uh, it's a tribute. And it's called Una Leaving. <coughs> Una Leaving. Heavy summer showers with their winds must have shaken elder blossom over your car where you parked in the yard. Because as you drove out along the mud track, a host of petals rose behind, flaring in, a wi in wide white drapes, a visible tailwind, leading me to think there makes the proper exit of a golden sister, as if newly wed, or off to become a chocolatier, such being the flourish of your going from whom I learned how to love well my daughters, and that age will always preserve the young in relative youth, keep their presence in our lives like yours in mine, clear and hopeful and star bright. Tom mentioned, I think, referred to a poem which is called Hen Boy, which is about Nicholas, my son, and his um, great friends, the hens, one of whom is named here as Whitey No Name, which is Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderfully inventive um, contingency. Hen Boy. It's how he handles animals that matters most to him, needing to be firm and sure and gentle. Only yesterday, we found a racing pigeon in a drain, its raw neck craning from the voided body. Pink ringed legs, surprisingly strong, and still he poked at it with intent precision, deaf to our disgust. The two escaping frogs I stopped the moor to point out to him, and how he deftly tracked down each one among the docks, homing them both into his half-clenched old man's fists, just as all the hens ran amok when Whitey No Name speared a third and paddled off, jelly limbs limply flapping from her beak, the others bearing down in hot pursuit, and he whooping at all creation like the circus master's son. <laughs> <coughs> I want to read a poem uh, called Creeping Jesus. Creeping Jesus was the nickname of a local man in Kilmurray Parish. Um, there are some here who will know who I'm talking about, a, a single man, a, a, a small farmer, um, who was, I suppose, um, named so for his excessive religious zeal. Uh, not that he was uh, trying to convert uh, people in any great quantities or, or in any great fervor, but he would always pay the vet, for instance, in scapages and mascards and missiles. And similarly, the shop, uh, he would never pay in, in, in hard currency, you would always pay in, in crosses or in, uh, intercessions or, 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 or whatever, but indulgences. So this is about the, the, the phenomenon, of, phenomenon of nicknamery. Creeping Jesus. A fesh drift adverts to the monk of St. Gaul, Knocker the Stammerer, his writings on Charles the Fat and Pepin the Hunchback, and to Wallafrid the Cross-Eyed, who so glowingly wrote of the Irish of the time, putting me in mind of Jerry Larry and his whispery praying at the back seat of the side aisle, his missile tied with scapular string and gorged with the mortuary cards he recited over and over again. Shot eyes, or were they averted? Hidden behind the smudged glass of his horn-rimmed dispensary specks. I saw him once bury, or unearth, a box in the soil 
between his low tin roofed house and the lane to Kilmurray. I didn't wait to watch for fear I'd be seen or that he would somehow divine the equally cruel cognomen by and for which he was locally known. We have neighbours whose dog we mind, not an unusual phenomenon, the Irish countryside or city side. Um, uh, and this is a poem called What Harmony, which is about um, minding a neighbour's dog, but in a, in a house which was blacklisted um, for all sorts of um, inherited reasons um, from me and my siblings uh, as a child. Um, what Harmony. When Michael goes away, we feed his dog Jago. Where he goes to, we don't know. And what Jago, and probably Michael, doesn't realise is that this house and yard were off limits to me as a child, out of old enmity. I like the way I can sweep in through the gates and swing around to shine my lights against the barn half door where the feed is kept, then enter authorised to see the whole setup of moors, old tools, flaking settle bed. And how I glimpse the lit inside of the house when I back back around again to face the narrow pillared gate. Pausing always for the time I never told of, she invited me in to see the portraits on the stairwell wall and say, <coughs> hauntingly, in her ridiculed stammer for being a single woman farmer at the creamery, asking after fat content and cattle prices, how she always admired my grandfather and what harmony he caused and, despite how like him I was. <laughs> We're going to go to Mushra now. Mushra Mountain is the um, one of the mountains um, to the west of here, um, and it is a place that I can see from my back door of the house that I live in now, which was a house built by my great grandfather, who bought uh, the townland back in the 1890s and settled there. Um, and I often go to Mushra, and of course, one of the things that I and my kids always want to do is get our binoculars and find the house, <laughs> rather than appreciate the. Uh, the views. Um, there is mention here of Bravo and Alpha. Bravo and Alpha are the two oil rig, gas rigs uh, out of Kinsale that you can see from the coast at, at, at coast level, but you can actually, believe it or not, see from Mushroom. There's the most extraordinary view of the south and east uh, of the country from there, from Mushroom. This is the farthest you can go and still see the house through the naked eye if conditions are right. Field glasses will reveal the surrounding lands in patchy detail. And beyond and above, impossibly, Bravo and Alpha stilted into the high sea. Over to the east, thin files of light escape the grey of the tarmac at Cork Airport. Peregrine, Galon, high steel cross. This is the territory of wind and far distance. So far away the place from here that I always think my grandfather must still be there. And who's to say what is or isn't the case? My children play on the cairn, greedy for their experience. Staying in the same vein, um, this is um, a poem um, about a piece of slate, um, a beautiful old banger slate, that slipped off the one of the outhouses um, at home, um, one of the others that I inherited and um, took responsibility for restoring, um, and, and the slate in the grass inspired this particular poem. There's a reference to winnowing here, which um, is a reference to the fact that my mother's family were millers, and there were Howards in Crookstown who um, created this um, Howards one way home ground whole wheat uh, flour. Lost heritage. The slate that lay on the lawn all month grew slowly ingrown, half hidden in weed, clover, buttercup, plantain, the long grass fringing it evenly. I hoped no one would step on it to relish the dull, flat snap and its subsidence into two or three half-sunken shards, no longer clean <coughs> slate but given in to splinters for reuse on the path far removed from the snug slot it once slid to, flattened on the rafters 
of the loft now gone. Like the men that built and kept it stopped, the oats they spilled from the hefted sacks, the invisible brain rustling rats, the mill that winnowed my life into its this existence. Um, I was really uh, <coughs> pleased uh, that um, this poem was included in the Wintarp anthology, um, edited um, by Niall McMonagall, published last year. Um, it's in the same vein as the, those I've just been reading um, in the last few minutes. It's called Fields, and it's about um, the loss of fields as much as a love of fields um, and, and the loss of fields associated with the breakup of that land, as I said, uh, acquired by my great grandfather way back. Fields. There's a place on the Dublin Cork line where woodland opens out to fields within the wood two or three, irregular in shape and secretive in their deep surround, unperturbed by the sudden pulsing passing through of trains, and then they're gone. I always seem to lift my eyes at just this point in the journey, signalled by some animus of field and its possession of me since a child for all the fields I have traversed and loved and lost. Full Coverage is a poem which um, I think Tom mentioned, which is a poem inspired by being outside one day uh, in the Haggart with my phone um, and um, being curious about an aeroplane and knowing that I had an app on my phone to do a, a lot of crazy apps, which will tell you the, um, all the details you want to know, even when the aircraft was made um, of, of that particular flight. So um, this is about that experience and about all the questions that attend that kind of experience. Full coverage. Do I really need to know this bright steel arrowhead, arrow, arrowhead passing over now is the TC-X36PW Thomas Cook from Tenerife to Glasgow? <laughs> I'm looking at the map my smartphone app has magicked up. An orange model plane traces its blue route through familiar names. Kilomini, Rylan, Glass. What do they, half sober, half awake, think when they consult their in-flight TV screens and see this bland green boat of field and lake? Does anybody care? Up there? Down here? Anywhere? Do we expect to know more now that we've geotagged the deep parts core? <laughs> Two last poems I want to read. <coughs> One is called Poor Conditions, and it's at of rain and other things. Poor Conditions. Heavy rain brings floods to corners and flats of fields, spilling out from the river through the wood into unseen hollows on the road to the Sarda. The alder groves the low islands at the bridge, the fields beyond, below the road, all disappear under a sliding broad mud flow that inundates a kind of dispensed time which we accept willingly for need and want of winter novelty. The rain seems to rinse clean the trunks, too, in the young ash belt by the road. Or is it the air between the trees that clears? Sometimes, on a day like this, as you drive beside the wood and glance through the trees fall into long lines of sight as you pass, when suddenly a hidden shadow alerts itself and springs into immediate speed, revealed now among the disappearing wood, full-bodied and running, it seems, beside you, silver-heeled, so that for one consoling moment you can't tell if you're a car-encumbered man coasting along the wet road on a routine errand, or a startled deer coursing through air like there's nothing anybody or anything can do to stop you. Last poem I want to read is a poem based in Cork, um, on the Mardyk. It's called Lauriston. Lauriston uh, is a, a house on the Mardyk. Um, I don't know who lives there, perhaps somebody here does. Who lived there, or knows who lived there. Um, I've been intrigued by the house. I was intrigued by the house as a young boy, 15, 16, coming in to Cork on the bus. Um, as the epitome of 
sophisticated, elegant, urban living. It's a beautiful house. Um, and, and I often wondered um, uh, who lived there. And I came back to Cork and came back to live here um, and was actually found myself, um, kids wanted to go to the museum, so we parked in, on the market and found myself back outside the house uh, much later and experienced exactly the same intriguing uh, mystery and almost not wanting to know the answer. So this is about Lauriston and about remembering. And thank you very much for listening. Lauriston. Who lives in Lauriston, the house in the park, on the Mardike, behind old railings and hedging? Is it the park keeper, or a city father, or some professor emeritus? I must know who lives in Lauriston. Who chose that eggshell pale blue, planted up the pots by the door, neglects to repair the chimney stack, savours the shade and seclusion from all who pass so close by? Who lives in Lauriston, I asked as I passed. We all need to know who have ever wondered at what we cannot see but imagine concretely. Who lives in Lauriston, a voice replied, but it was mine answering me 30 years later. Thank you very much. Introduction. Um, I won't actually be reading the poem that he mentioned. I thought it was so 2007. But um, he actually gave me the best part of it anyway, so um, possibly not, not a lot. Paperweight. The Gaelic poets were kept in their place, a rock on the chest to teach them to breathe. Other men's songs weighing on their hearts passing through them to be born on their backs. They added nothing until the words they mouthed were safely on the wind, dry leaves blowing about the green land, a few new lines at the bitter end. Uh, a long time ago I had a summer job in uh, Toronto in a law firm in a skyscraper and I spent most of my time uh, looking down at the sun falling on uh, Lake Ontario. Travel light. Pack everything you need, then throw away half. Let's see what you've got. Luminescent, incandescent, evanescent. How long are you going for? And all this <coughs> sparkling, flickering, shimmering. What were you thinking of? At the bottom, some heavier bits and bobs, longing, falling, yearning. You can get those anywhere, cheaper too. Zipped in a pocket, a tonsillon. Put that away or you'll lose it. So it's empty now. You wouldn't have got far. Um, this next poem has a, an epigraph from uh, Mary Shelley. Showdown. I was not even of the same nature as man. I was more agile. Frankenstein. <clears throat> At Chamonix, on the Mer de Glace, Frankenstein meets his monster. Among swaying alpine trees, the creature says, look in the mirror. You can't win facing your monster, his leaden eyes, crooked smile. Cobbled together from the dead, he fights like a master. All bolts and scars, he matches your moves, kicks, spins, soars. You can't give up. You dream of taking him apart starting again. So, uh, as was uh, mentioned by Tom, I now work in the, the university 
um, and that involves carrying out uh, academic research, which is a, quite a lonely line of, of, of work. And this poem is about that. There's a reference to the, the Bodleian, which is the, the great library uh, in Oxford. I'm obviously not comfortable to John's pool library, but uh, <laughs> it's been on for a while. <laughs> Scholar, I have two enemies. One is good. Baby giraffes <clears throat> trouble her mind. The arc of their necks when they sleep. The other has a cane, a taste for gin. He said only, I know who you are. His ex-wives curse him over elderflower cordial. What they have in common is that they are wrong. The strength I give to avoiding error, they spend concealing it. They hide in the dust they kick up. My soldiers have cracked spines, crusty veterans parading on shelves, ranks swelling with the years. From this little room, we will crush my enemies. Two others in the world will understand my book. Pickford and Perryman bickering in the Bodleian. They will confirm the destruction of my enemies. <laughs> It doesn't matter that it doesn't matter. My enemies return a single daisy from the sun. My hands are full with their throats. I was a little concerned, actually, that, that I wasn't angry enough. And <laughs> <laughs> the many of the poets at the festival have commented on how angry the world makes them. I, I listen to the news and I'm irritated. <laughs> Partly that other people don't think like me. So, um, but I'm getting there. So, um, this next poem also has a legal flavour and is a, a different in tenor, I suppose, a, a found poem. And um, a note at the end of the poem states that the, the words in the poem come from the judgment of the Court of Chancery in the case of Underwood against Wing, 1855, including the testimony of Joseph Reed, sole survivor of the wreck of the Dalhousie. Wreckage. Breathed a few seconds the longer at the bottom of the sea. The ship Dalhousie. So as to come up again. The husband had his wife in his arms. Hauled myself over on the weather quarter. He could not call asphyxia death. The two boys were holding on to the mother. Little pieces of wood in the water. Captain Butterworth sung out, for God's sake, look here, <coughs> in their night clothes, grabbing for or trying to lay hold of one of her boys. When the water came up to my knees, being picked up and having a decent burial, heavily over on her starboard beam ends. I do not think they were separated, westward of Beachy Head. <coughs> standing together on the side of the ship, a pepper and salt shooting or morning coat. The husband with his wife in his arms. A man could not judge very well of time. And the two boys clinging to their mother, all clasped together. May God bless you and get you safe to land. A sea swept them right off and I saw them no more. East India docks, bound to Sydney. They all four went down together instantly. The whirlpool made by the heave of the ship's counter, beating of the sea against the ship, and never rose again, wrecked and lost, the last to leave her and am the only. This next poem uh, is, in a sense, a political uh, poem, although it also has a ancient Egypt uh, angle. <coughs> Take away some of the effect. Um, it's called Burden. <coughs> the next life will be like the one they knew, and they will need many things. Ebony boxes with cedar panels, turquoise and jasper, myrrh and moringa oil. They will make their denials to green-skinned Osiris, prompted by the Book of the Dead. 
I have not brought forth tears. It was not I who caused pain and hunger. When hearts are weighed, theirs will be lighter than truth. Soul and body will be kept together, safe from the crocodile jaws of Amit, eater of bones. Beyond the lake of the jackal, in the reed fields of Hetep, there will be crops to sow, watercourses to fill with water, the sands of the east to carry to the west. But when the overseers come to seek what is due from the great, the little carved shabti will spring to life, offer to serve in their place, take on the burden. Changing the mood somewhat, the next poem is about a, a Looney Tunes cartoon character <laughs> called um, Pepe Le Pew. <coughs> Do we have any takers for Pepe Le Pew? <laughs> <laughs> Two people is a very good percentage. Uh, so he was a romantic skunk, a romantic skunk from uh, France, and the object of his attentions was always a an unfortunate cat squeezed under a white painted fence or in some other way acquired in an alluring white stripe. Um, so this is called Me and Pepe Le Pew. She liked the classics. Bugs Bunny, Tom and Jerry. I introduced her to Pepe, a French skunk, in pursuit of painted felines. You are a corn beef. I am the cabbage. She licked latte from her lips. No one talks like that. Luckless kitten, peddling air. He chased her down in a few dreamy bounds. Lovey's a many splintered thing. <laughs> he squeezed her breath away. I spoke of l'amour, like Pepe. Alone at last, mon petit chouchou. <laughs> That's funny, she said turning away my little cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I suppose sticking to animals, um, the, the title of my uh, Kavanagh manuscript was From the Extinct, and um, it was really an attempt to mask all the poems about death by pretending that it was about extinct animals. And um, I was always quite interested in the moa, this, uh, 12 foot high extinct um, flightless New Zealand bird um, that only became extinct actually fairly recently. So the boa has a, it's not a central part, but it has a cameo in this poem, which is called <coughs> Postcards to a Human. One, the arc of the extinct. We're all aboard, the last of each kind. Wish you were here. Two, Cruising, Tasmanian tiger and moa squabble over quoits and who'll have to bunk with whale. <laughs> Three, do the math. We birds and beasts can't multiply like you can subtract. Four, prima donna. He cackles on the deck, legs in the air. Dead as a what? <laughs> Five. <laughs> Five survival stakes. Knocked out early, we cheer from the sidelines. Our money's on rat. Six. Change. Weather mixed, getting warmer. See you soon. <laughs> Another stingingly political um, <laughs> poem. <laughs> Now, um, I'm not sure if you can take one other um, animal poem, but um, <laughs> the title is a medical term for diseases that are transmitted by animals to, to humans. And it's spelled just with the word zoo and then the word noses. So, zoo noses are what we catch from animals, even our pets. When we lean too close, breathe in what they breathe out. Our noses twitch. Too long chained down, they get the itch to migrate. Swap places with a snout, trunk, or proboscis. 
before my wife can shout, leave the cat alone for Christ's sake. <laughs> Buka has my rhinitis, and I'm smelling the world in HD, head exploding with grassy memory, you tails swishing, then I'm out pissing on a tree in the garden as Puka powers up my laptop to check the garden. <laughs> I was told that it was very important to at least once shout that this is key to a good reading. And so now, I'm sure the target been waiting for a sequence of poems about my deceased father, and um, actually also his, his father. And so, um, in the interest of humanity, I thought I wouldn't read all of it to you, but um, I will I'll read part of it. It's called uh, My Father, His Father. The Wrong Man. Incensed in your coffin at the top of the church, as the priest laid to rest, the wrong man. Quiet, kept to himself. I could almost hear your heckle. Ancient History. One. Story of tainted milk in the 40s. You in a fever hospital, peering through a fogged pane at parents on a ladder in November cold. Your father says, you'll be home by Christmas. You wail. Your mother kicks your father, who falls off the ladder to land 40 years later as a graveyard cough down our hall. Two. Every evening until he dies, your father drinks a pint in silence. At his funeral, a great turnout. Greeting the town, streaming up the steps, your mother wears a cashmere coat your brother got in Dan Coleman's. He says she looks a million dollars. Next day, she exchanges the coat for a blue one and a red one. She tells Dan, black isn't my color. Three. Your father looks up from the Irish Independent. How would you stop? He says. It'll hurt the child's feelings. Your mother picks up her coat, walks out the front door, leaves it swinging. Your father looks at you, opens his mouth, closes it again. Listen to your father. You were setting me straight on Hottie and the hames he was making of the country when you were ambushed. You meant to say Charlie. Dev slipped out. Long haul. One. A tiny plane crept across a map of the world on the bulkhead screen. How high, how fast, how far to go. Once a minute, the Kibla compass pointed to Mecca. Two. Sometimes they don't tell you when you're finished, but let it dawn through nights of not going home, days shouting at doctors while nurses shush and tuck you in, and the morphine starts to work. Three. There was nowhere in Kuala Lumpur Airport to cry. Four. The time zones relented. Each slice of the world paid back its toll, and in the hours reclaimed, I reached you. And you were beautiful, white hair and thin, thin arms. Your father's brows, quizzical above, our darkening eyes. Um, mercifully, I think we've reached the three-poem warning. <laughs> this might, might be true, but I, I think we're at a, a three-poem warning here. So, um, honkers, this isn't poem, honkers, bangers, and singers. What does that mean? How are you in Asian cities? That's expatriate slang of Australian. Hong Kong, Bangkok, Singapore. Very good. Um, not that you really be passing moral judgment in those cities, but um, so um, this poem is called Expat. Warm rain and gin slings on the roof of the bank tower. I eat the red apple meant for show. At the goldfish market, the merchandise mouths help from plastic bags. <laughs> Hats off for the temperature check. Butterfly flu at airport and docks. The sick wear the same masks as the well. I uncover 
the lips of a stranger. <laughs> My visitors talk about Blade Runner and dystopia. Wonder what I'm doing here. Now, um, the next poem is about my brother. My sister is here and my brother isn't, so it's somewhat ungrateful of him, but still. Um, <laughs> and it's not necessarily a privilege, I suppose. <laughs> this poem is called Michael. Out of my sight, in the big tree, finding a way past the fork where I always turn back. You rose calmly, trusting the thinner branches, ruffling the sky. And there you froze, a bird-eyed ghost. I ran for our mother, stood with her on the path. Queenie Daly stopped to talk about young Quinn's fall that broke his back. I called up to you to stay where you were. So, look, thanks very much for listening, and many thanks to uh, Pat Cotter and Jen Matthews and the Monster Literature Centre for giving me the chance to, to read here and to read alongside John, who actually I knew before he was uh, officially a poet. I visited his house and I noticed all these poetry books and I thought, is there anybody who owns poetry books who doesn't actually write poetry? So I suspected that he might even then have been a poet. So this song is a little song. It's yeah. <laughs> all so beautiful. <laughs> It's called it's about, uh, Cork on a Saturday night. I uh, like John to finish with the Cork poem. It's called Finbar's Angel. When she blows her trumpets, from imagined corners, the earth folds up. The living come from narrow houses to stand against the reclaiming dead. Holy murder in Barrack Street, rain in the air. The old wind carries curses down the lanes. Never again Sunday morning, to light on glass, blood, and limping dogs. Go the back way, down the steps to the river. Come and find me.